Okay, I'm going to start up by waxing philosophical to start, which is hopefully going to depress a lot of people in the room. But um, I think when it comes to placemaking, we don't make the places. They really do make us. And, it, and it's hard to really understand that until you get into it a little bit. But I want to talk about the first placemaking place -making ordeal that we got into, and that was the very natural progression for a family who lived in New Orleans, Louisiana, to move to Wyoming. And uh, <laughs> in my mother's words, you're in a place where it hails, it sleets, the wind blows two weeks nonstop at 70 miles an hour, there could be 100 degree temperatures or negative 20 and you can have tornadoes, don't you think God's telling you something? <laughs> of course, mom hasn't left there in 35 years, so. Uh, it's a place I love to visit, not a place I want to live, but I sure enjoyed my childhood there. Um, growing up in Wyoming, I got a real different sense for what it meant to work with nature and work around nature and survive nature. I graduated the University of Wyoming and then made the natural progression of moving to Arizona and then to Seattle, Washington, and then back to the Denver, Colorado area as a teacher. And then was giving a presentation in Anaheim, California when two people approached me and said, hey, we've got a really cool project idea to start up a school. And so made my final natural progression of moving out to Indianapolis from that convention in Anaheim to start up Paramount School of Excellence. And whether or not you're for or against the charter movement, we're all for the kids. And uh, it's, it's a big endeavor to start up a school to help the kids. And there's a lot that goes into that. And one of those things was filling seats. And as I wandered into the Brookside neighborhood my first week in town, I was dressed to the nines, a nice tie, really uh, pointed, polished shoes, a nice heavy wallet. And uh, I was going around to businesses that I could find in the Brookside area, there are a few of them, that um, are really interesting to visit, and dropping off flyers for the school, because if we don't fill our seats, we don't have a school. And as chief marketer and chief everything else for the school as the original principal, it's my job to make sure we're marketed and we're going to fill those seats. And I remember going to a very interesting looking grocery store in the Brookside neighborhood, not on 10th Street, but tucked into the neighborhood. And um, a, a really salt of the earth neighbor parked in his van outside of this uh, little store was just sitting there as I went up to try to knock on the door and give a flyer. And he called me over one of those kind of, hey, son, come right on over here. I was like, oh, good, I got somebody, you know. <laughs> He's like, hi, my name is Tommy Reddix. I'm here for the Paramount School of Excellence. I would really like to show you about it. And he's like, you better lose that blank and blank and tie. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no. And he says, I know what you're doing over to that blanky blank school, and I don't like anything of it. I don't want anything to do with you. And for 30 minutes more, we had a pretty engaging, very colorful conversation. And the great thing about the guy is at least he would talk and express his opinion back and forth. And for those of you that do know Phil on the east side and in Brookside, He's really a great guy, but boy, is he opinionated. And what I didn't know, the backstory as far as placemaking is the building that we had bought to put this school in, which is a Masonic temple built in 1922 over in the Brookside neighborhood. Uh, we had beat out the outlaw motorcycle gang uh, in bidding for this building. And Phil, Phil was, you know, affiliated with the bike gang. And so he, he had a lot of bones to pick with what was going on. So. Long story short, I had to use it, um, we currently have Phil's kids in our school, so that's good stuff. So. Um, some memorable moments as we started placemaking in the community was trying to, trying to make our dent in that neighborhood as far as acceptance. And, you know, obviously I am white as a white guy can get, and a very Irish, Catholic, and... Um, from the Midwest, but more West Midwest when it comes to Colorado, and I stuck out like a sore thumb. And I, I still maybe do, but maybe I'm more accepted for that now. But I started attending the neighborhood meetings in Brookside and uh, became kind of a honorary Brookside member since we do have a business or school in the area. Haven't missed, a, well, I've missed three meetings in three years, but they've been because I've been out of town. So fairly loyal in that respect. And I think that makes a really huge, huge difference. And you mentioned, the relationships you have with your neighborhood, it really does make all the difference in the, the amount of trust that we have in that neighborhood now. While there's still people that might not be trustworthy in the Brookside neighborhood, I don't feel bad walking around with a tie and polished shoes now. I still might guard myself a little better. 
but I'm also recognizing the community and I can drive down the community and I've got, I've got students that will recognize me and greet me with a smile and, and parents that will either throw food at me or recognize me with a smile. <laughs> But either way, there's a, there's a mutual respect for what we're doing in the neighborhood. And, and I think fast forwarding to our relationship with KIB and starting this school, it's such a big venture in bringing a school to life. And the great part of what we're doing is we wanted to be a green school and we got nine acres. And it's really, really rare in any inner city or any urban environment to be sitting on that much green space uh, for any educational institution. And so that was really cool, except for the fact that once you put your building up, you've got nine acres. And what the heck are you going to do? And, and boy, really quick, we were able to partner up through a Kaboom grant in our first KIB project to put in our playground area, to put a fence around a garden area, to build some planter benches. And that was our first KIB experience where we first got our hands tied with Andrew Brake and some of the other fun friends, Phil Schaefer at KIB. Um, and a classic example of what some of those projects look like, and I'm sure you can relate, is for the Kaboom project, you have a build day or a prep day followed by a build day. And in the last five minutes of all this intense work, your superstars would show up. Like we had um, uh, Indianapolis Colts wide receivers show up and put the final piece on our playground and get his picture taken. And the Colts can say, yes, we built a playground. You know, and it was easier than I thought it was going to be. You know, and the rest of us were like. Last year, we did a very similar thing with the Indiana Pacers. We built a garden shed. And um, of course, two days before, it was Phil Schaefer and myself and one other person from KIB building all the walls and putting everything together. And then the Pacers show up, and we slap it together and put some paint on it. Tyler Hansborough's painting a quick coat of blue. And again, not misquoting at all, we have one of the Pacers players on TV saying, yeah, you know, I, shed building is not as hard as I thought it was. Yeah. <laughs> And you know, a lot of physical labor, but again, couldn't do it without the relationship we had with all the, the help at KIB. And moving forward to our current project, um, really excited about it. As a former music teacher for 14 years, um, I've got a great passion for the arts and a great passion for creativity and wanted to do some kind of mixed feel uh, for the tree line adjacent to our school along Brookside Park. And we've got, like I said, a nice big area, but part of that was a very invasive tree line and uh, we spent the better part of the last two summers, myself with the chainsaw and Andrew Brake, helping out uh, Renee from the neighborhood, clearing all the invasives off that hill and getting it ready uh, for purposing that area as a peace park and something that would be accessible for the Brookside community. And what I really wanted to do is, instead of having this be a park where you come in and look about how clean the ground is, have it be focused on the tree canopy itself. So we want to do art installations and music installations up in the canopy of the trees. So when you visit the park, yes, you can sit down and have your serenity and have that peaceful moment, but you're really going to be drawn up to recognize what's going on in the green space above your head. So excited about that work. We have a long way to go, and probably three quarters of a year until we get that close to finished. But uh, that's our project. That's where we are. So appreciate it. <laughs>